chemical reactions relate to the law of conservation of mass. So we're going to relate those evidences of chemical reactions to the law of conservation of mass. For our starter, describe the structure of an atom. When we describe the structure of an atom, we talk about the three subatomic particles, where they're located, their electrical charge, and their mass. Let's start with the proton. Protons are located in the center of an atom called the nucleus. The electrical charge of a proton is positive. The mass of a proton is one atomic mass unit. A neutron is also located inside the nucleus with a proton. However, their electrical charge is neutral. There's no charge. Their mass is the same as a proton, one atomic mass unit. An electron is found outside the nucleus in the electron cloud. The electrical charge of an electron is negative. The mass of an electron is so small, we say it doesn't have a mass. So I'm going to put 0 AMU. Okay, so to describe the structure of an, an atom, remember you want to name the three subatomic particles and you want to talk about three things, their location, their electrical charge, and their mass. Evidences of a chemical reaction. If you can remember this little mnemonic device, Older city girls love their phones. It's going to help you remember the evidences of a chemical reaction. If you write down, older city girls love their phones, and you take the first letter off of each word, O is going to stand for odor, which is a smell, a change in a smell. C is going to stand for a color change. This is when you have a new different color being produced during a chemical reaction. G for girls or guys is an indication of gas production. So whenever you have bubble fizzing or foaming taking place during a chemical reaction, gas is being produced. Love, the L is going to stand for light production, like fireworks or fireflies. There, the T stands for temperature change. So that's where you have a release or an absorption of energy. The P on phones is going to stand for a precipitate formation, which is a solid product that falls to the bottom of a test tube. So these are your evidences that a chemical reaction has taken place. So when two substances react, they're going to produce a new substance. And how do you know you have a new substance, which is the best evidence? These are some clues like odor, color change, gas production, light production, temperature change, and precipitate formation is going to indicate we have a new substance forming. So let's practice. So I'm going to read to you and we're going to try to investigate the situation and see if a chemical reaction has taken place. So we have solution 1 and solution 2. Compound A dissolved in water at 25 degrees Celsius and compound B dissolved in water at 25 degrees Celsius. It reads, a student combined two clear liquids, colorless solutions shown below, above. The student ob observed that the temperature changes from 25 to 23 degrees Celsius when the solutions were combined and that a white substance rapidly formed and settled to the bottom of the container. What most likely happened to produce these results? So we would understand that a chemical reaction has taken place because we do have evidence that a temperature change took place. We had a decrease in temperature 
temperature when these two substances were mixed. We also had a white substance rapidly forming and settling to the bottom, which is an indication of a precipitate. So what most likely happened to produce the temperature change in the precipitate? A new substance was forming. So the solutions reacted chemically because that precipitate occurred and we had a temperature change. So here we have our reactants on the left side of the arrow and we have our products on the right. And here we can see our reactants and our products are balanced, meaning whatever we begin with, the mass of what we begin with must equal the mass of what we result in. So it reads, coal contains carbon and other elements. Carbon dioxide forms when coal burns in the presence of oxygen. What is the best evidence that a chemical reaction occurred when coal burns? Okay, so here we have carbon reacting with oxygen to produce a new substance. So the best evidence that a chemical reaction occurred is a new substance being produced. We no longer have that carbon and oxygen. We now have a new substance, carbon dioxide. Student observations. So we have observations um, during substance one, substance two, substance three, and substance four. Students in chemistry lab conducted an investigation in which they added four different solid substances to separate beakers of water. They stirred the mixture for one minute and then recorded their observations in the table above. Which substance most likely caused a new substance to be formed when mixed with water? So remember, um, your mnemonic device, older city girls love their phones. If you take that first letter, the O is going to stand for odor. C is going to stand for color change. G is going to stand for gas, bubble, fizzing, foaming. L is going to stand for light change. T stands for temperature change. P stands for precipitate. So, let's look at their observations and see if a chemical reaction occurred. So when a substance dissolved, dissolving is not a chemical change. That's just physical, going uh, from one state to another. Substances cause bubbles to form. Remember, bubbles are indication of a gas being formed. The substance sank to the bottom. That is not a chemical change floating or sinking. Okay, and then lastly, the substance floated to the top. That is not evidence that a chemical reaction took place. So it looks like substance two um, experienced a chemical change because we have that evidence of a gas production. So now we have four other investigations, and then here we have observations after two liquids are combined. A scientist performed four investigations using eight different liquids. In each investigation, the scientist combined two of the liquids under a hood and recorded the observations in the above table. In which investigation is it least likely that the liquids reacted chemically? Explain your answer. So on this one, I'm going to grab my web paint and I'm going to write that mnemonic device, older, let me write it over here, older city girls love their phones. Just that letter is going to help me remember my evidences of a chemical reaction. Remember, odor, color change, gas production, light production, temperature change, or precipitate. So in investigation one, it says the temperature of the combined liquids increased and a solid substance formed. So here we're having a temperature change and we're having a precipitate form. So that is evidence of a chemical reaction. The temperature of the combined liquids decrease and bubbles form. So again, we have a temperature change and we have a gas production because of the indication of the bubbles. So both those are indications that a chemical reaction occurred. 
the liquid settled to the bottom of the beaker and one liquid rose to the top. This is sinking and floating. Sinking and floating, again, is not observations of um, chemical reactions. The combined liquids turn from clear to a bright purple. Here we have that color change. So that is an indication that a chemical reaction took place. So which one least likely reacted chemically? Least likely reacted chemically is where, you, of course, you have that floating and sinking, but your other ones are evidences of a chemical reaction. Okay, a student poured a blue solution of CuSO4 into a beaker. The student placed a shiny silver, silver-colored strip of zinc metal into the solution and observed changes. The process is shown in the diagram above. The student inferred that a chemical reaction occurred. What evidence supports this? Explain your answer. So here we have a blue solution. We still have a blue solution. We add the zinc. And then here, not only do we have a color change, because now we have a clear solution, but we also have a new substance forming. And a new substance is your best evidence of a chemical reaction occurring. Um, a solid also forming here on the zinc, we could also uh, say that that is part of a precipitation. So a dark solid formed on the zinc metal indicating a new substance and the solution changed color to a clear solution. Nitrogen dioxide is a gas that can be generated by emissions from vehicles and factories. It can also be generated by natural sources, such as forest fires, light, lightning, and microbial activity in soil. The equation for producing nitrogen dioxide is shown above. What provides evidence that a chemical reaction occurs. So here are two reactants and they're producing a new substance. Again, a new substance is your best evidence of a chemical reaction. And we do have gas production happening here. So we are producing a gas, which is a clue as well that a chemical reaction has occurred. The picture below shows an investigation conducted by two students. Explain what happened. So we have a blue liquid at 22 degrees Celsius being poured into a clear liquid at 22 degrees Celsius. So they're both the same temperature, okay, but when we add a blue liquid to a clear liquid, we're going to be diluting the color. We are not getting a color change because it's not a completely different color. It's simply diluted. It means it's light blue. In order for a color change, we need to have an unexpected color, but we can expect when you add a blue liquid to a clear liquid, we get a light blue liquid. Our temperature is still the same, but we have solid particles forming at the bottom of the test tube. So your evidence that a chemical reaction occurred would be the precipitate, that solid substance forming and settling to the bottom of the test tube. So a precipitate, a solid was formed indicating a chemical reaction occurred to form a new substance. Now we're going to look at the law of conservation of mass. So if we want to calculate the number of oxygen atoms in a, this chemical equation below, we would use our wrap strategy to help us count our oxygen atoms. So on the left side of our chemical equation, we have reactants. In the middle, we have our arrow, and then we have our products. So it means when these two substances react, they're going to produce or yield a new substance. So if we wanted to count our oxygen atoms, let me get some web paint. I would like to count my oxygen atoms and my reactants first. So I have a coefficient and I want to look at my subscripts. So coefficient times subscript 
would give me 12 hydrogens. But remember, we are counting just our oxygen. So I'll skip my other elements and just go right to my oxygen atoms. So six times one oxygen atom gives me six oxygens here. Coefficient times subscript here. Six times two would give me 12 oxygen atoms here. I have six oxygen atoms in my product, and then I have six times two would give me 12 oxygen atoms here. So 12 plus 12 is 24 plus 12 more. Let's write it down. 24 plus 12 would give us 36. So I would have 36 oxygen atoms total in my chemical equation. Now if they asked you to just calculate the oxygen atoms in your reactants, you would just look at the left side of the equation. And if they asked you to calculate your oxygen atoms in your products, you would just be looking at the right side of the chemical equation. So let's do the same thing here. I'm going to grab my web paint. And here we have our reactants and our products. So we have a chemical equation. When these two substances react, they're going to yield or produce these products. So first thing we want to do when we count atoms is list our elements in our reactant side. So look for your capital letters. I have a capital C with a lowercase. So that lowercase belongs to the uppercase. That's copper. Lowercase l belongs to the uppercase. That's chlorine. Nitrogen and hydrogen. So if I wanted to count my atoms, copper does not have a subscript, so it's just one atom, that one that we see. Chlorine has a subscript of a two, so there's two atoms. Nitrogen does not have a subscript, so it's just one atom of nitrogen, and hydrogen has three atoms. Going over to our products now, okay, uh, what you want to do is look at uh, copper. There's one atom of copper. This NH3 is in parentheses, but it doesn't have a subscript after it. So nitrogen would just be one atom there. Hydrogen would be three. And then chlorine has a subscript of two. Okay, the law of conservation of mass. The mass of your reactant side of your equation must equal the mass of your product side. According to the law of conservation of mass, matter can't be created or destroyed. So the mass of your reactants, when they react, must also equal the mass of your products. So if you begin with 100 grams of a substance, 60 plus 40 is 100, okay, in your reactants, you must end with the same amount in your products. So I should have 100 grams of product because matter is not created or destroyed. Okay, so you want the masses to balance, to be the same. Okay, so on that note, let's have a look here. Using the law of conservation of mass, what is the mass of your product being produced in the chemical reaction? So let's have a look. So this side of my equation are called my reactants. And the right side over here is referred to as the products. So according to the law of conservation of mass, the mass of my reactants must equal the mass of my products. So the first thing I want to do is find out, well, what is the mass of my reactants? So I have to add 49 plus 20. So the mass of my reactants is 69 grams. So the mass of my products has to be 69 grams as well. Okay, but if I know that my water molecule is 9 grams, I'm going to have to subtract that from 69, and the mass of this substance then must be 60 grams. Because remember, the mass of your reactants must equal the mass of your product. So whatever the mass is here, the mass must be the same in your reactants, in your products. 
Okay, let's do another one. Using the law of conservation of mass, what is the mass of HNO2 being produced in the chemical reaction? So let's do the same thing. Remember, this side of your equation are called your reactants. These are called your products. And I need the mass of my reactants to equal the mass of my products. So let's figure out what is the mass of our reactants. 20 plus 5 would give us 25 grams in our reactants. So my products, according to the law of conservation of mass, must be 25 grams as well. Well, if 15 grams is this substance, how much is this substance going to be? So we want to subtract 15 from 25. Okay, and the mass of this substance then must be 10 grams. Okay, because 15 plus 20 would equal 25 grams. So how would we grid that? Simply by putting your numbers in and then shading them in. And lastly, you would do the same here. So using the law of conservation of mass, what is the mass of this substance? So we would need to add and find the mass of our reactants because the mass of our products must be the same as well.